Hi and welcome to the next in the series of videos that I seem to have found myself doing on the Bruder range of RC conversions and this one is going to focus on the Jeep Wrangler which just turned up in the post this week. Now I did, if you've seen the other video, do a conversion to the Land Rover, the Brood Land Rover, and I've been extremely pleased with this. It was a very successful conversion in my view, and I've taken it over to the forest and had it running around. And something which people have pointed out to me is the fact that first of all, it's only two-wheel drive, and secondly, it's got these rock-hard tyres. So, rather than change anything on this, because actually I'm really happy with it for what it is. I thought that I might do something slightly different with the Wrangler and when it turned up as I suspected it is a slightly different scale to the Land Rover I measured this against my own Jeep Wrangler and I sort of looked at the pictures and stuff and I came to the conclusion that in terms of what this is effectively modelled on Wranglers came in two forms. There was the TJ, which is what I've got, and the LJ, which was a longer version of it. And one of the giveaways is this distance here between the back of the door and the rear, rear wheel arch. On the TJ like mine, this kind of finishes virtually underneath the bottom of the door here. On the LJ, it's more stretched, and that seems to be the main place where it's long between the two and you end up with a more rectangular window. I took various measurements of this model and I actually measured the equivalent on my car and whilst it didn't come up with the same answer each time I reached the conclusion that this is probably more like 1 to 13 and a half or 1 to 14 it's certainly not 1 to 16 which is supposedly the Bruder scale the Land Rover and I think I mentioned this in the Land Rover build is roughly 1 to 1 15th so what you end up with is you end up with a Jeep Wrangler which is satisfyingly quite a bit bigger than a Land Rover but that wouldn't quite be true in reality now the useful thing about that is that I'm actually able to use one of my existing radio control vehicles as a donor and this was incredibly inexpensive and I'll probably end up sending off for another one and building another one of these what that difference in scale means is that I think that I can get away with if I just pull one of the spare tires off or the spare tire I think that I can actually get away with this size of tyre which when I calculated it would roughly bring the tyres in scale up to about 30, between 33 and 35 inches, probably 34 inch tyres which wouldn't be ridiculous in a slightly lifted Wrangler and if I use the mechanics from this um, WPL Hilux I'm actually going to be able to get four wheel drive because there is a differential at each end. I also would have a choice of different motors and I think that I would try the one that's, that, that came with it. And this was the kit version and I made a video of that. I can actually use a choice of different motors depending on the sort of torque versus speed balance that I want to achieve. When you look underneath and you compare the track of each vehicle and I haven't glued these tiles on yet but I'm going to because even on the Hilux they kept coming off and I might try and figure out some form of tar foams if you just put the two next to each other you see that the track of the tires is actually less on the Hilux, Hilux than it is on the Wrangler so it isn't going to be too wide and in terms of wheelbase the Hilux is 190 millimeters versus the Jeep 175 
which would mean if I wanted to keep these four link suspension arms what I would need to do is to move them slightly closer to the motor. I am not going to do an almost real real time build like I did with the Land Rover. What I'm going to do is I'm going to explain as I go along and certainly show any of the more tricky steps. Right, on with the build. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to basically take the Jeep apart. So for the start of that it looks as if we've got two tabs at the back here and we've got one at the front. It actually looks less difficult than the Land Rover to be quite honest. So just slipping a screwdriver in this black tab here, just moving it back a bit so it's out of the way so I can, I can pull the red one towards the front of the car. should allow me to release the rear bumper like so and then up the front there's a little red tab here and here inside the bonnet that has broken off it isn't really a problem because if I found that the body doesn't easily hold itself on I would just use some screws but with the Land Rover that never happens so these two red tabs here seem to snap off when you bend them back I'll set those two off which should allow me to release the black chassis from the red body right so it would appear that the first thing to do is to get the engine out and you can see these two tabs here which correspond to these two holes here because without that nothing else is coming off brilliant we've actually got the thing off it was very tempting for me to do the removal of the body not on camera but I think it's pretty frustrating for anybody trying to follow the build if I miss that out so apologies if it looked a bit messy and difficult that's because it was but here we here we have the rolling chassis this starts to give you some idea of the amount of space which is going to be available which isn't a whole bunch so I'm going to have to be extremely careful how I use the room that I've got that's that side of things and I'm going to be pretty well dispensing with any of the mechanisms which are in here because I'm going to need every inch to be able to put this mechanics and running gear in. Right, so after just a couple of minutes work, this truck is now reduced to a rolling chassis. I think that I'm going to start by trying to mount the differentials from each end onto, onto this chassis and then figure out where the transfer box goes. So the first thing for me to do is to do some more dismantling on this which is basically to remove the existing axles. Right, that's the that's the rear axle out. Springs I'm sure they'll come in useful one day. That. And what's quite handy is actually it's giving me somewhere to line up this axle when it goes in. I'm not sure how much of this I'm going to have to carve out but I suspect quite a bit. Well, that came out a bit easier. You know, in a few years time I'm not sure if I'd feel so good about doing this. Uh, these are discontinued and it's an extremely nice model. I suppose people are going to start collecting them. I'm not really a collector of anything even though I've ended up with an awful lot of radio control models. 
I might just end up buying another one of these to have, but I'm not really sure what the point will be. Right. That's the steering mechanism out. This piece here, the steering column, I think that that's probably a luxury that I'm going to struggle to be able to keep. So that's going to come out and I'm going to have to think carefully about securing the steering wheel. I might end up just gluing that part back in here somehow. It appears that it might slide out. Sort of. So we've got that piece out and I know that that belongs in there and forms part of the inside of the car. So I'm probably going to trim that and glue it back inside there. Right, so far so good. So we've got a bare chassis. Time to start thinking about putting these ends in. And I actually finished the model and I've now taken it apart again so that I can show the stages which I went through in order to do it. I'll go through in the rest of the video the parts I cut etc. The part of the model which took me a long time to do was to actually modify the chassis so that it would accept the WPL Hilux um, components and the first thing which I did was I cut a hole for the main transmission case which is, which is here which I basically left intact in the first place and what I did was I measured the distance between the two sets of spring holes on the brooder having obviously taken, taken the two axles out and that was my 175 mil if I remember correctly, I'll just check that yes, that was, that was 175 mil Using my indelible marker pen, I marked the centre and then I precisely measured the size of this transfer case and using a combination of hacksaw, knife, file etc. I, I cut a hole that, is, that was exactly that size and then what I did was I dropped this transmission into the hole, used some slow setting thick super glue and activator just to tack it in place and then once I was happy that this was in the right place I used this epoxy which whilst it sort of sets in a rubbery kind of way in about five minutes still takes about 12 hours to fully harden but the really good thing about it is first of all that it, that it doesn't run for very long and secondly it's repositionable for quite a, a period of time before it sets really hard and then when it does set hard it's kind of like any other epoxy so you can sand it, grind it or whatever. So that, that went in next. Now you'll have probably noticed that there are holes and bits cut all over the place and I'll put a whole series of photos in towards the end of the video so that if you're wanting to have a close look you can do that yourself. But basically what I wanted to do was to be able to install the front and the and the rear axles from the WPL model and 
get it all to all to fit in the right place. Cutting all of this involved quite a lot of trial and error and I did have to add some things to the chassis to make it work. First of all, on the bottom here, for the lower of the four link suspension arms, I actually used these parts here from the Tamiya Tract Vehicle Kit. And these are kind of spares which I, which I hadn't used in previous models. Quite useful to do, I had to drill them out to four millimeters and then I had to slightly widen them using, using, using this. These, when I was building the thing, initially, again, I, I tacked it with the super glue to see if everything fitted okay and hold it in place, and then I just smothered it in that 90 second epoxy. So, so those went on. For the um, other links, for the top links, I actually cut some scrap pieces of plastic and actually these came from one of the, one of the previous models I think it was the Bruder trailer conversion I did I just found some of the plastic which I cut off because I kept those bits because it's quite useful hard plastic and um, made them into little right angle pieces and I'll just zoom in for a second hopefully you can see those there and again I made four millimeter holes and the line up for these was such that when the when the um, four link suspensions pieces go in that they're actually butting up against the outside of the chassis there that seemed to give me the right length for the wheelbase and to kind of get them in the right sort of place. On the bottom here, they're actually lined up to about the same place as well. So, so if you look here, you can you can you can see how that comes down and is roughly lining up with the end of that case. That way, I knew that I could get everything square and. It worked out that the axles pretty well sat over the centre of where the springs were on the original model. One of the big challenges of this particular build is the fact that the original model which I, which I was adapting had 190mm wheelbase and also quite, quite a steep angle on the on the drive shafts so somehow I had to try and lose about 15 millimeters in the length on the drive shafts in order that I could fit it all in and it didn't bind so what I had to do was I had to chop down both ends of the universal joint here without making it so short that it either fell off or wouldn't grip and each end I ended up cutting off roughly the same amount and it was literally a case of doing it, of doing it millimetre by millimetre, chopping a millimetre off this piece, chopping a millimetre off the end piece there and putting the model together and, and to see if it would all fit and to see whether or not this was binding and was too tight. So. After quite a while, I arrived at measurements. One thing to bear in mind, and if I just, again, I'll, I'll zoom in. If you look here on the, on the, on the drive, it, it doesn't quite go down square at the very bottom. And that means that if you were to just chop, try and get it. Yeah, if you were to just chop this drive shaft end piece here, you would you would end up with with a gap 
just because of that strengthening piece on the other side. So what I did was I had to cut back, and I doubt this will show up in the, in the video, I had to cut back the tiny tabs in there which um, form the kind of grip, the thing that, that um, holds the other piece in order that I could get them, get them to go flush. That I did using the end of a 4mm drill bit and just putting it in and moving it round very very slowly until I'd cleared those, those little tabs off. For information, the amount which ended up on the drive shafts, and it will be different depending on how a person's model ends up, um, this is the steering end and you can see that there's about about six millimeters left of that and on the rear end it ends up a little bit longer with more like nine millimeters and for the shafts on the front That's about eight millimeters there, and on the back, about six millimeters. So that's that's how this all ended up. Before I go further, I think that I ought to probably explain the cutting which I did on the body shell. And I didn't have to do that much, but what I was aiming to do was to keep the exterior of the car as close as possible to how it was originally and not have anything inside and not have anything inside cut around. So the model, as far as possible, apart from the um, transmission, the wheels and tyres, I wanted it to look like the original model and the driver be able to sit in there etc. So the cutting which I had to do, I had to do some cutting around the front here to make room for the steering servo which I'll come to soon. This area in here is is quite important for putting wires into and the battery pushes into this area and again you'll see that later in the video so what I did was I kept this arrangement here which holds the steering wheel but I trimmed it right back so it was basically flush with with the inside there and um, again I tacked it with the super glue and then put some epoxy on to hold it in place the steering wheel actually gets held in by the dash when you do that so we still have a steering wheel which goes round that's that and then inside the bonnet you'll see that I chopped out an area here and that is where I push the battery in and the distance between the top and the bottom of that is about 14 millimeters for the hole and where I and where I use the front suspension what I did was I matched between the chassis and the and the body so that the front shocks could push up inside having worked out where it went on the main chassis and if I just put the two together for a moment you'll see how they line up and what I did was having having done the black chassis I just went around it with my marker pen poured it off and then I was able to trim this to the same shape the other piece of trimming which I did was to the to the front here and I had to remove some of the plastic at the bottom of the radiator and I didn't actually have to do anything to to the front grill at all. 
having somewhat glossed over the trimming of the chassis and the body I'll get on and show you the build this probably took me the best part of a day to do and there was a lot of assembly disassembly reassembly to get everything just right when you're when you're doing the trimming you need to remember that it's much easier to remove material than it is to put it back and I tried to remove as little as possible obviously in my experimentation I probably removed some things which I didn't need to but I'm fairly satisfied with what's left here is certainly enough for it to be a functioning model and enough cut away so that everything works properly now for the front suspension as you have probably already gathered I actually stuck with this stock WPL dampers well they're not really dampers they're springs and for the rear just before I started carving things around here I actually discovered that by putting the original brood of springs back in their holes that actually the suspension worked fine and it saved me a load of work and also cutting around the rear that I think would have spoilt it inside and it would have been difficult to have kept the seats in there and it just would have spoilt the look and that really allowed me to keep the thing looking as it was when it first came as a toy right so if I just start with the transmission this this as I as I said all I all I did was I trimmed these two parts here are the universal joints. I'm thinking that at some point in the future I might just upgrade those to the metal ones and and also put uh, metal gears in here but for the time being I think it's fine. So I'll just pop those in. That's fine. Now I did drill some, some holes in various places so that I can route the wires and you'll see that I put a connector here so that I can connect it to the speed controller and keep all of the electronics separate in the bonnet. We'll come to that in a few minutes. For now I'll just leave these out because it gives me better access to putting, putting the screws in. So starting with the back pop the two springs in. Now I don't think that these need to be retained because I don't think they're going to come out. If they did need retaining I would just drop some epoxy down in there and then they would stay in place. But what this does do is it gives me the option of increasing the amount of spring I've got by, by um, putting some form of packing down there to push them out further. In terms of where the right height has ended up I'm happy that these are the right length but if I was to make it heavier in the back or whatever I could actually change that oh, I probably ought to mention that the that the that the dampers actually hold in the lower four link suspension arms with this piece here so I actually unscrewed this part on the rear and I trimmed off the piece here that it screws into so so if you look there you can you can see that this part here has been trimmed and that just holds it nicely in place Post that through. Not, not forgetting this thing. just hook in because they'll fall out I'll just pop those screws in now you 
yeah, you I want them so that they're kind of loose and it, and it doesn't cause the suspension to bind. I did have to trim a little bit off these so that the screws had enough room to move. I just cut the knife. Just zoom in on that for a second so you can have a look. You can, you, can, you can see the little bit which I trimmed there. And then flipping it upside down. Just attach the, the upper links. In order to get a screwdriver onto it, because the angle here is horrible, what I did was I actually drilled a small hole in the chassis there so that I could push it through and get onto the screw. So here we have the rear suspension, there's plenty of movement in it, a little bit of bouncing up and down and even with the body on um, it's still got some movement in it. And I'll just show you what's going on in there. It's quite hard to get the light in, that's it. So those actually come off which is not too dissimilar from my from my real Jeep actually. There's the spring separator and the dampers are separate. Now the other end is similar but the main difference being that you've got these dampers to mount and you've got the steering to think about. So I'll just go ahead and do this end. Link up the drive shaft. Put in the last suspension arms. This keeps falling out until you put the top bit in. That's that. Flip the truck around. That all seems to be moving okay, but it's got no spring to it yet. So then this piece here, which I glued on, also came from the spare parts left over from the brooder trailer. I just kind of cut it into the right shape, made a four-mill hole, etc. And this post through, and if you can see, I've got it locating there. And the screw. The angle for screwing is not ideal, but it's not something I tend to take on and off very often. You can you can do it up quite tight because the collar on there keeps it loose anyway. That's that. And there's some good movement. I think at this point it's worth mentioning what I did with the wheels. Having washed both the wheels and tiles, and I turned the tiles inside out for this in hot wash-up liquid just to remove 
any release agent which might have been left on either the wheels or the tyres in the manufacturing process because that always makes sticking really difficult. Having um, washed them, I then left them to dry overnight because little bits of water do stick on there and I actually put them on the radiator a bit as well because you really don't want water. And I gave them a quick spray and I actually used Halford's wheel and wheel trim paint which is meant for plastic and it's called steel and it's actually a very close match to the kind of Bruder grey which you get with the with the um, silver plastic from Bruder on the original wheels. I really wanted to keep that look. And then when I glued the tars on I actually used Gorilla Super Glue because what I really liked about this was that it, it comes with a little brush in addition to the nozzle there and that makes it much easier to make sure that you, that you get the glue all around the seam and then having done it I tested the tiles to see if any air was coming out and where it was I put more glue on and used a cocktail stick until I had airtight tiles and that's quite useful if you want to run the truck in water and not get water in. I know that the tires become a little bit less squashy, but I haven't got foams in there, so I think that that's quite a nice firmness. So if I just pop the wheels on, Doesn't need to be too tight. You can see that I've achieved a fairly sensible kind of ride height, the suspension all the way around. There's, there's actually quite good articulation, even without the weight of the car and the battery, etc. So that's all quite good. It's it's going to be bouncy, but then this is what it is. I could put oil dampers in, but then where do you stop? Okay, that's almost the bottom done. The last thing to do is to think about where to route the wires, because you don't want the wires interfering with the suspension. You want it coming out in the right place and particularly you don't want anything sticking in the way of where it might stop the body being able to go down. The only trimming I had to really do on the body was these two tabs here which hold the seats and this part in. I didn't actually have to take this out at all while I was doing the build but I had to trim these two off because they were actually fouling with these suspension arms here. I'll just quickly go ahead and put in the cable ties which I'm using to keep the wires out of the way. Right, that's those in. I think it makes for a much neater job. And it's one last thing, to, one less thing to cause problems. Right, the next thing to do is to drop the body on. And having done all of this, that's actually quite a straightforward thing to do. I just need to remember to make sure that this wire is accessible. seems to prefer to clip on at the back first like so then in the middle and then the front just clips in anyway so that's all looking good I did I did previously when I was building the Hilux 
install the servo arm so I've just left that in place. Now the first time I put this together I actually marked out where the servo goes, cheating a little bit, but again that can be trial and error. Whenever you're sticking one of these servos down with, with tape to a plastic body it's always best to clean it with isopropanol alcohol otherwise the stick just will not stay. So using my double sided sticky tape and you would normally do this with the servo horn attached so that you can make sure that everything moves freely. For speed I'm just following the marks which I previously put on and hopefully that will be okay. I think I better test it though. So take the screw off here and also you you would also always make sure that you previously linked up the servo and that you set it at neutral the most important thing is that there is clearance bet between the servo and all of the surrounding plastic both at the back and at the front which is which is why previously I had to trim some off here and if I just push it in place I can see that I've still got I don't know if you can see that but I've still got a gap between the servo horn and the and the front here so before I put the speed controller in I'm just going to test to see where it goes now this battery is a pretty precise fit here which is why I had to cut that bit out of the front wall of the engine bay there and I know that this speed controller will fit in there pretty exactly and that the grill will go on but I only know that because I've already done it obviously um, so using the isopropanol alcohol I need to clean both the back of the speed controller and the top of the servo to ensure a good stick. That's about the right position. To get the battery out, I need to plug in the motor. And post that wire out of the way. Like so. And then the battery connector is going to sit down inside there. Next thing is the receiver and I'm using an orange spectrum compatible one. Really with the, with the electronic components you want them as small as you can get them and I want to be able to plug the parts in. I've got plenty of room in the bonnet so I'm actually going to stick that quite high and stick them out there. Making sure that I miss the front coil. So I think there will be okay. The aerial just needs to make sure that it's kind of out of the way. That's all looking okay. And I'm leaving the switch floating, but I know from having put it together before it's best to have it sort of sitting round about there, sort of fairly well out of the way. Right, we're almost done. Put the grill together. Does it still fit? It does, a bit tight on the receiver, but that's okay. Make sure that the bonnet still shuts with a click, and it does. That's good. 
and then put the battery in. So the battery that I'm using is the same as what I used on the Land Rover. So it's just a little 1300 milliamp hour 20C aeroplane type battery. But that seems to power these things for ages. Battery is held firmly in place. I think that I want the switch just to rest about there. I might mount the switch somewhere at some point. Make sure the bonnet still shuts. If it doesn't, just move the wires around a bit until it does. That's it, shutting with a click, and we're almost ready to run. Just a couple of last things. We need the driver in there, and he likes to rest his arm on the door there. Not forgetting the roof. there and of course the spare tyre that's all looking pretty good The transmitter I'm using is the old silver kind of Spectrum car transmitter. The good thing about this is that it works with those orange compatible receivers which the newer black Spectrum transmitters tend not to. Although having said that, Spectrum do actually make small receivers that size. Turn it on. We have steering, we have traction, let's give it a quick go.
so as a quick conclusion to this video I'm happy with the way this has turned out I like the look of it um, I like the way it goes um, it isn't going to be an out-and-out -out rock crawler certainly not with the sort of components which I've used in terms of things which could be better um, the fact that it's got this transmission sticking out the bottom here which is what I had to do in order to not mess around with the seats or the interior it does catch on things easily I think that the gears inside each of these two could probably be a bit stronger there plastic and if I push it hard I can hear some not very nice noises I might send off for a, a metal set but having said all of that it goes well with the rest of the Bruder range I really like the body I've built quite a lot of Jeep Wrangler TJ's in my time and if you look at my videos you'll see that and this is certainly one of my favorite ones in terms of how it looks yeah I think that I'm over I think I'm very happy with this with this conversion I bought a few other Bruder models and um, I'm going to be having a go at those in the coming weeks I expect anyway I hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you found it useful please keep the comments coming on the videos I do enjoy hearing what you've got to say and what you think and ideas that you might be having for other people so again thank you very much for watching